So they lived in Connecticut, and it's where I grew up. This happened when I was like 14. It was either right after Ed Warren passed away or not too long after. My father and I were staying at my aunt's house one night. It was a two-family house, so her and my uncle, as well as my cousin, her husband, and their two children all lived there. It was a new house that they had just built and moved into a couple of months back. I found this part out later. Leading up to that night, my aunt was having crazy dreams where a little boy would appear in her dreams every night, or so she thought that they were dreams, and lead her out of bed. My aunt said that outside of the house was a very bright light that shone through the windows, to the point where she couldn't see anything outside, and the little boy would try to lead her outside. My aunt would always be found in the morning by my uncle around the house, passed out on the bathroom floor, living room, even the garage one time. They just assumed my aunt was sleepwalking. So anyway, that night at about 2 a.m. or so, everyone hears this loud screaming coming from the upstairs living room. Me, my dad, my aunt, and uncle all wake up and run upstairs because it sounded like someone was hurt. We get up there and my cousin and her husband are in the living room, and my cousin's son, who was about two years younger than me, was sitting in a rocking chair. His back was to us, but my cousin and husband were freaking out. So my dad and uncle walked over to my cousin and went to see what was wrong. My uncle touched his shoulder and he turned his head around and it was bright red. His eyes were bloodshot and his skin was starting to turn this weird grayish color. When they tried to ask him what was wrong, he started speaking in this weird gibberish that we later found out was Latin and was rocking in his chair back and forth. So he was known as kind of a prankster. So my uncle and cousin's husband, thinking he's playing around, yelled at him to stop and went to grab him out of the chair. When they touched him that time, he let out a loud scream again in what was Latin, and his eyes started to roll back into the back of his head. We were all freaking out at this point, not knowing what to do. My cousin went and got a glass of water, thinking maybe he's sleepwalking and threw it on him, and he just laughed in this terrifying deep voice. My aunt was a pretty religious woman. She would keep crosses and angel statues and even holy water in the house, so she ran back downstairs to get the holy water because, at this point, we realized something very weird was going on. My dad and uncle grabbed him out of the chair. He was kicking and trying to fight them the whole time and held him on the floor. My aunt brings over the holy water and rubs it on her hands. My cousin lifts up his shirt while he's being held down and my aunt places her hand on his back it literally starts to burn him. It left a burn mark the exact size of her hand on his back. He screamed and screamed for a couple of seconds before he ended up passing out. I'm just standing there the whole time absolutely terrified, not moving, and just kind of absorbing all of this happening. So, he passes out and not knowing what to do, they call the police. It's probably around 3am at this point. So the police come with paramedics and talk to us all, and the paramedics check out my second cousin to see if he's okay. He ended up waking up, and they said that he was fine, except for the burn mark on his back. Not knowing what to do, the police recommended they give Mrs. Warren a call since she was a famous paranormal investigator and lived right here in Connecticut. So nobody ends up going to bed at all, and me and my dad leave later in the morning. Now this next part I wasn't there for. About a week later, my aunt gives Mrs. Warren a call, tells her what happened and invites her to the house. Apparently Lorraine knew what the house was about before she even stepped foot in there. Apparently the newly built house was built on land that housed some kind of portal to the other dimension, as she put it. The little boy in my aunt's dream was trying to lead my aunt outside through the portal, because if a human entered the portal, it would be open enough for demons to constantly come and go through. From what Mrs. Warren was saying, apparently one got through and was able to possess my second cousin because he wasn't strong enough to fight it. Well, Lorraine ends up doing this whole seance operation and cleansing of the house to get rid of it all and close it permanently. And they ended up living in that house for about another eight years without any problems ever again before selling it and moving out of state. But I never stayed over there again. To this day, I really don't have many details beyond what I was told, but that night, 
still haunts me beyond belief. I grew up in an eight-bedroom farmhouse with my father until I grew up and moved out. We always had extra rooms not being used and because of the age of the house plus all this extra space, there was always a sort of eeriness, like someone looming in the shadows. If I had to get a drink in the middle of the night, I looked at the ground the whole time because I was scared of what may be looking back at me from the dark corners, rooms, and hallways. Even the windows and mirrors were avoided because I wasn't sure what I'd see looking back at me. When I was around 12 years old, I questioned why the room that used to be my nursery was locked from the outside. I didn't think it was weird before then. My dad needed a room for storage and I figured he just wanted to keep me out. I brought it up to him one day, asking what's so important in there that he needs to keep me out even though I'm not a child anymore. It was a typical 12-year-old mentality I had. Turns out, I was not entirely correct about the lock. My dad, with a very serious demeanor, sat me down and answered my inquiry. When I was a baby, around one to two years old, I slept in this nursery room on the second floor next to my dad's room. This room was painted by my sister especially for me with Winnie the Pooh characters and fluffy clouds, the type of thing I think back on and appreciate. The effort and creativity was so admirable. I had a photo of me smiling at Pooh Bear on the wall while we were setting it up, but I'm not the most tech savvy to figure out how to link this photo. But anyway, I was in this nursery in my crib, again right next to my dad's room, the perfect age to be on my own. Every night though, my dad was woken up by me sort of scream crying. He had raised four children before me, so he was not making first-time parent mistakes that would otherwise be in question. He thought it was probably the switch to being in my room rather than being in his room that caused my nightly discomfort. He considered bringing my crib back into his room, but of course the nursery was all ready to go. I had just graduated. For a while, when I cried in terror, he would come in and check on me only to find that nothing was wrong in the sense of present stressors like temperature, diaper change, hunger, or thirst. He would stay with me until I would fall back asleep or keep the lights on to make me feel safer, and then return to his room to get some actual rest. One night, after finally having enough of my distress, he decided to camp out on the floor of my nursery to see if he could figure out what was the matter, but mostly to try and sleep through the night. This is the last time anyone slept in there. I was able to doze off now that I wasn't alone. He, on the other hand, was tossing and turning on the hardwood floor, not comfortable enough to sleep. As he lay there on the floor, mulling over the situation, boom, boom, boom. He was jolted to his feet by a few massive blows to the floorboards beneath him centered directly on his back, as if someone on the first floor had a battering ram aimed at the ceiling. His first instinct was to rush downstairs and check for intruders. He's a man of logic, brave and ready to defend his family. However, when he got down there, the lights were off. There was no one downstairs. Front door locked, windows locked, no sign of forced entry. No one else lived there with us. Our closest neighbor was down the road a quarter mile, and why would they break in just to bang on the ceiling, let alone have it mapped out where my dad would be sleeping in my nursery? and the force of the blows, this wasn't normal. After this event, my dad brought my crib back into his bedroom, and I was able to sleep without screaming or crying beyond needing a diaper change or something normal. He brought the Bible into the nursery for extra measure and casted out any evil that may have invited itself in there. He locked up that nursery and only used it for storage after that, and only went in during the daytime. To this day... That old lock is still on the door, as if a lock will keep spirits locked in. And short of pretending that experience never happened, he couldn't rationalize it enough to do anything else. We think the entity was evil and malicious, and when my dad tried protecting me, this only made it more angry. As I grew up in that house, I had a hard time sleeping in any room on my own. Many nights I ended up rushing to the couch in the living room, turning the TV on and watching Disney till I fell asleep, but even then I was not fully comfortable. 
there always felt like there were eyes on me. There were many more unexplained events from that farmhouse, but this was the more direct encounter with evil that my dad has ever had. So about 15 years ago, I was living with my ex-girlfriend and my sister and her husband in an old house not far from town. Within the first few weeks of living there, strange things were happening regularly. Lights going out randomly, noises upstairs. At one point, one of the windows at the back of the house was cut, like someone went at it with glass cutters trying to break in but gave up on it and left. Just creepy stuff like that. That was bad enough, but things got pretty severe as time went on. One week in particular was nuts. The first thing that happened that week was on a Tuesday night. Everyone was working and I was home alone watching television when I noticed our cat was acting really weird, backed into a corner and arched up like it was scared. When I went to get up, the electricity went out in the house and it was pitch black inside. The second that happened, I heard really loud footsteps running down the stairs to me. I got up and braced myself for whatever it was, but there was nothing. I gathered myself and went outside to the front garden to check if other houses' lights were on, but my house was the only one that was dark. I went to the fuse box and reset the trip switch and all was back to normal. A few days later, I think on a Thursday, we were all in the sitting room watching a movie with a pizza, lights on and a good atmosphere in the house. When out of nowhere, a massive bang happens upstairs. We go up to check it out and I went into our bedroom and saw my bedside table in the middle of the room. But the worst and last thing that happened to me was on a Saturday night. And I'll never forget this, and it still gives me chills when I think about it. We go to bed, everything normal, watch a bit of a movie and fall asleep. I wake up facing the wall and glance at the alarm clock. It read 3.13 a.m. I turn over to go back to sleep and I see my ex standing in the middle of the room. Confused, I begin to sit up and ask her what's up. But as I start to sit up, I realize my ex is asleep in bed next to me. A surge of fear runs through me and I'm frozen on the spot. My eyes adjust and I barely make out the figure. A young girl in a nightdress with a cartoon character on it soaking wet with her head down looking at the floor. I can hear the water drops on the carpet and I'm just sitting there, completely shocked. I couldn't believe it. After a couple of seconds, it kind of just melts away, like fades out of sight. I got up and turned on the lights and tried to tell myself that it was just a night terror or something, but the problem with that was there was a freaking wet patch where she was standing. I moved out shortly after that, and I can still picture her to this day though. It's the creepiest thing I've ever experienced. Now I'm not sure if I shared this here before, but it was interesting and one of the reasons my wife and I don't go to the drive through late anymore. Years ago, our McDonald's was a 24-hour store. As my wife worked until 3 a.m. and I was on her sleep schedule so she wouldn't get lonely. About 4 a.m., we were hungry and decided to grab some food. We ordered and were waiting at the window when we saw this guy walk up. I'm getting the nastiest feeling coming over me. Dread, despair, terror. I wanted to bolt from our car and run for my life. The guy just casually walked to the restaurant and... When he passed under the streetlight, I saw this thing floating behind him. It was freaky, about six feet tall, all black except for a large white face. The face had dark sunken eyes and multiple sharp teeth poking out between its lips. It had long arms with clawed hands on the man's shoulder, and below the hips it just dissipated, so it didn't really have any legs. My wife hasn't said anything and usually isn't sensitive to the paranormal so I didn't expect anything. But as the man walked out of the light, the thing vanished from sight and I heard our car doors lock. I looked at my wife who was pale, with wide eyes, and she just goes, Tell me, you saw that. 
I confirmed, and we just watched the guy continue walking into the restaurant. Seeing it was scary, but the fact that my wife could as well was absolutely terrifying. When I was 13, I babysat a little girl named Emma, one of the sweetest kids you could think of. I was a regular babysitter for her, so much so that when I couldn't babysit for a few months, she called all her other babysitters by my name. This happened after I came back to be a regular babysitter for her. It was about 10.30 at night. I had already put Emma to bed and had been channel surfing. The house was set up so that the front half was open concept. The living room, dining room, and kitchen were side by side. In between the living room and dining room was an open doorway to the back half of the house. At one end was Emma's room. The other end was her parents' room with the bathroom connected to the parents' room. I was sitting on the couch. I heard something run down the hall to the bathroom. Assuming it was just Emma going to the bathroom, I let it be for a few minutes. And I heard the feet heading back down the hall eventually. I turned to tell her to go back and make sure that she flushed as I hadn't heard it, but I only saw the tips of black hair that had ran past the open doorway. Here's the problem. Emma is blonde. I quickly jumped up and rushed to Emma's bedroom, throwing open the door. Her nightlight was bright enough to make her out as she sat up and looked at me, rubbing her eyes in confusion. I asked if she had went to the bathroom. When she shook her head, I did a once-over of her room, checking under her bed and a quick peek in her closet. I didn't see anything, and I just told Emma I was double-checking for monsters. I tucked Emma back in, saying goodnight, as I headed out of her room again, leaving it slightly open. I began to walk away, but stopped when I hear Emma speaking. Thinking she was going to ask me something, I turned to listen, only to hear, You should have said something. Don't scare her. I really like her. I didn't say anything to the mom about it and continued to babysit Emma until they moved away. I always made an effort after that to include the being. If Emma was drawing, an extra spot was set up. It seemed to make Emma happy and, thankfully, nothing else ever startled me again. So before my dad came to North America, he was practicing to become a priest. In some cultures, it is widely believed that a priest should also learn about and perform exorcisms. It's a very old world thing, but still a very prevalent thing. My grandfather used to perform them, and so did my great-grandfather. My dad had told me some of his stories. They're pretty fascinating. I grew up in a heavy Catholic household, but I'm not very religious. I'd like to believe in ghosts, but I've never seen one. So naturally, when my dad told his stories, I was sort of skeptical. The one thing my dad likes to hammer in is that I take after him. He believes I have a gift like him. He used to tell me he was so successful with exorcisms because he is like a sixth sense and can feel, hear, and touch the supernatural. He can sort of understand them. I, on the other hand, can't do that. My weird gift is being able to dream about things vividly and have them happen soon right after. It feels like deja vu, but I know what is about to happen. I know it's more common than people think, so I don't really pay much mind to it. One day, when I was about 14, my dad received a phone call. It was an acquaintance who knew of my dad and his work back home. Mind you, my dad had now become a therapist, kind of the opposite of a priest in my mind, and... I hadn't done an exorcism in probably a decade that I know of. Side note, my dad has also been liberal with parenting. My mom was a nurse and always working, so we spent a lot of time with him, and between me and my two other sisters, it was a free-for-all. If my mom was there, she would have told my dad no way. So my dad takes the phone call, agrees to the job, and then looks at me. He announced I'll be joining because I have his gift, and wants me to understand what he does. Fine, I thought. And we pull up to this big house in a more affluent neighborhood in our city, and I already feel sick to my stomach. 
I can't explain the feeling. It's like the moment we drive into the driveway, I was nauseous and panicked. For no reason. It was a normal house, nothing out of the ordinary. I told my dad how I was feeling, and he quietly told me that we were going to go inside. There was a couple in their mid-forties that lived in that house. They had no children, just the both of them. The husband opened the door, and the first thing I noticed was the bags under his eyes. Second thing I noticed was that the house had no lights on inside. After we entered, I felt like the air in the house was being sucked out of my lungs. I don't know, like if you put your mouth to a low-setting vacuum, it was really weird, I know. I've never felt that way before. My dad sets up a little shrine in their living room and prayed to it. Then him and the husband went upstairs to see his wife. For some stupid reason, they left me alone downstairs in the den. So it's dark because their lights aren't on and I'm sitting on their couch. I suddenly feel like what would be fingers poking at my back, like viciously, like people with long fingernails just jabbing my back to get my attention. Now, I'm on a couch that is against the wall, so my deduction is, how can this even be happening? Naturally, I'm too afraid to look, so I just get up and walk straight out of the room without looking back. I walk into the kitchen and I can feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I feel as though there are people behind me, talking softly as not to disturb me. It sounds like two men and a woman are speaking, but my dad and the couple are upstairs and it doesn't sound like them anyways. I'm too scared to move and I just stare at the fridge for what seems like an eternity. My dad comes back downstairs after a while and I tell him what happened. He was sympathetic and told me to pray as he brought me back upstairs with him. and I was too scared to be left alone. He brings me into the master bedroom of the house and I see the wife for the first time. She looks small and fragile, laying in a four-post king-size bed. The curtains are all drawn and the only light is coming from the candles my dad has lit. She doesn't acknowledge me. Her husband sits in a corner of the room, quiet. My dad places me in a chair next to the husband and we watch my dad together. He's praying over the wife's body and she suddenly sits up in bed, screaming. The curtains in the room all fly open at once and my dad and whatever is left of this lady are just staring at each other eye to eye. The husband, in a panic, basically scoops me up and carries me out of the room. I stand in the hallway as he goes back into his wife and my father. After seeing that, and experiencing what I did downstairs, I'm just trying not to absolutely soil my pants, and angry at my father for thinking it was a good idea to bring a kid to these. I don't feel alone in the hallway, so I basically just sit down on the ground and try to think of being somewhere else. My dad eventually comes out of the room and he doesn't talk. He doesn't really say anything to the husband, only whispered instructions and we left. I didn't see the lady again after that. My mom was livid at my father that day for bringing me along. I mean, it was irresponsible, and I'd like to think of myself as less of a skeptic. To this day, I'm not even sure what I experienced myself. My dad hasn't done an exorcism since. My girlfriend and I moved into a bigger place about a week ago. It was not a bad price for the size and the extra room is great considering we both have cats. The first few nights were great, no issues. We spent the first few nights stressing over every house settling noise and trying to keep the animals calm due to them both being in a brand new place. Well, about three nights ago we both started noticing odd behavior from our older cat. She's too, as she started sleeping at the foot of our bed and just looks out into the hallway all night. We have both woken up to her with her hair raised, hissing at the empty hallway. My girlfriend noticed it first. The first night anything started happening, she woke up to go to the kitchen to get something to drink and she said she heard talking from the kitchen. Not thinking anything of it, she kept going in there and when she got close, she said that she heard a loud shh noise and then the house became dead quiet. The second night, I couldn't sleep due to stress from work. I got out of bed to use the restroom and noticed our older cat at the foot of the bed again. Same stance as before and just 
making this deep meowing growl. Did my business and went and lay back down, and I eventually passed out. The next morning, my girlfriend and I had to be up early, and she asked me how many times I got out of bed, because she kept waking up off and on to footsteps down the hallway. She described it as boots on wood flooring. Last night, I finally heard it myself. I woke up to the cat hissing and heard what sounded like someone pacing up and down the hallway for what felt like ten minutes. I know being tired could be a factor, but it was audible enough to hear it clearly. I decided to share this because whatever this is decided to make some noise about an hour or so ago. We were folding laundry in the room and it sounded like a large pot hit the ground and someone sighing really loud and pounding on the wall from the kitchen. When we went to investigate, nothing was disturbed. And before anyone asks, no, I'm not a skeptic. Yes, we checked the crawl spaces, a habit I do because most people fail to mention any water damage. No signs of squatting, just bugs. The one above the house is clear and the one under the house is just full of plumbing because we winterized the pipes the first day. No drugs or alcohol between either of us, no history of mental illness either. Not sure exactly what's going on or whatever it is, it's extremely active and has been for the past few nights. Now last night was uneventful, or we both slept too hard to notice. I'm up getting ready for work at the moment. Only thing that was strange is that I woke up to my older cat kneading my head, which is out of character for her. She's sweet when she wants to be, but never goes out of her way to do so. I've always been told that cats keep evil spirits away. The Egyptians praise them, and makes you wonder why. To answer any questions, yes, there are sensors and alarms in my house. I've checked every nook and cranny in this house. Apart from bugs and dust, there's not any signs of human or animal life in the tight-to-fit spaces. The bottom crawl space in my house is locked up tight and no signs of possums or raccoons. The house was built in the 70s. We got a great deal in the place because we agreed to rent to own. The only history I know of is that the older lady who lived here before was a bit of a hoarder. The baseboard heaters were put in right before we moved in, so they were new models and barely make a peep. The fridge doesn't make ice, and there was only one soft spot in the floor, but it's so out of the way, you really have to try to step on it. My girlfriend has always been sensitive to hearing things, as I have unfortunately been given the sight side of it. Yay for me. I've never messed with anything of the occult. No Ouija boards, no rituals, nothing of the sort. I've had experiences as far back as I can remember and could give some backstory on them. My girlfriend's experiences that triggered it in her was when a friend of hers and her did that radio static thing. She told me it was when you turn a radio on to a station that plays nothing but static and you ask it questions, and she swears up and down that something had told her about the passing of a family member that actually came true about a month after the fact. I haven't tried smudging the house yet either as some of you have suggested. I always felt like cats were a nature made ghost and demon repellent. This happened in, I believe, July or August of 2017. My husband, our three daughters and I were at the beach having a get together with some of my extended family who lived in the area. It was a really nice time and good to connect with everyone. But after a couple of hours, my second oldest, age 13 at the time, came up to me and asked if I could take her home. I could tell by her expression and tone that she was pretty tired. She and I are both introverts, and I'm sure she was less than thrilled to be spending a nice summer night with her cousins that are all a good deal older than her. I wasn't feeling too great myself, so I found my husband and let him know that I was going to take her home and to let our other girls know. She and I got in the car... We had brought two since my husband came to the beach on his own after golfing and made the short five minute drive back to our house. It was only once we'd parked, gotten up onto the porch and jiggled the door handle when we realized it was locked and we didn't have a key. My husband had the main one and the absence of our fake rock in the garden told me that my eldest daughter had once again used the spare to get inside and had left it in the house. This was all very inconvenient but nothing that hadn't happened before so I told my daughter to go around back to try and climb in through the huge window above the kitchen sink. 
While she was making her way around the house, I tried calling my husband just in case she couldn't get in, but he didn't pick up the phone. Once again, not too out of the ordinary. The reception at the beach is terrible and he was probably way busy anyways. I was in the middle of trying to call my oldest daughter when I looked through the window next to the front door, which allows you to see through to the kitchen in the back, and saw my daughter standing in the kitchen doorway. It was dark thanks to the screen so I could only make out her silhouette, but it was definitely her. I know my daughter. She's quite short like me and has a very petite figure like my mom, and I could recognize her from miles off. Great job, I remember calling out. Come unlock the door now. But she didn't move. By the way she was standing, I could tell that she was staring right at me, but she didn't move a muscle. At first, I thought maybe she was on her phone or something, but I could clearly see her arms on either side of her. She was standing in quite an odd position as well. Her feet were a good distance apart and her arms were slightly raised from her sides. I didn't feel uneasy yet, but I was very confused with her and we continued to stare at one another for several more seconds. Lily? I remember saying again. No more than five seconds after her name left my mouth, my daughter came jogging out from the side of the house and up the steps telling me she couldn't get inside because there was a screen on the kitchen window and she couldn't pry it off. I stared at my daughter. My real daughter. For multiple seconds with what must have been a very terrified expression because her face instantly fell and she asked me if everything was okay. I couldn't answer. And I remember feeling my whole body start to shake as I slowly looked back at the window and into the house. Maybe I had imagined it. No. This thing in my house was now in the living room, still standing in that weird position and staring right at me, but now at least ten feet closer. Fear and adrenaline shot through my veins in a way only a mother can know, and I practically yanked my daughter from those steps as we ran to the neighbor's house to get a spare key. Whatever was in my house was gone by the time we returned, or at least out of sight from the window, but... I did not let my daughter leave the neighbor's house until I had inspected every inch to make sure that there was no intruder. When I had more or less calmed down and was positive no one was inside, the whole thing started to seem more and more ridiculous as it played out in my head. The human brain automatically tries to give everything a logical explanation, so the more I thought about it, the more I was feeling like I had been imagined. I barely even considered calling the police. What would I even say to them? Hello officers, I saw something in my house that looked exactly like my daughter, but I don't know what it was because she was standing right next to me when it happened. Absolutely not. And I eventually chalked it up to me being exhausted or whatever because honestly, what else could it have been? The last thing I wanted to worry about was some random thing in my house acting like the girl from The Ring. I didn't tell my daughter about my experience. I just apologized for losing it a bit and told her I thought I saw a wasp nest. A terrible lie truly, but she was either too tired or didn't care enough to question it, and her and I went straight to the TV room to watch her favorite show, Criminal Minds. That was not exactly my first choice of programs after whatever had just happened, but if it meant getting to keep an eye on my daughter for the night, I was more than happy to oblige. I know I said I chalked it up to imagination, but I still couldn't shake that feeling that my girl was in danger. It tormented me for the rest of the night and I must have checked on her at least five times while she was sleeping. Over three years later, I still think about it frequently and it seems less and less like a terrifying daydream. I'm almost positive that there was something in my house that night. Let me know your thoughts on this. Am I being dramatic? Nothing has happened since and I never told my husband or anyone else, but it still torments my mind to this day. I'll say this to start off, I'm an avid Goodwill shopper. Half the furniture in my room and my closet are from Goodwill. That said, nothing like this has happened to me before and in the years that it's been since this happened, I've had no experiences. I was shopping casually one day when I came across something I thought was cool. A framed pressed flower on an old looking piece of paper with faded elegant handwriting below it spelling out the scientific name for the flower. 
The picture frame looked like it had been painted over with purple nail polish and was much, much larger than the paper, in a way that was eye-drawing but kind of off-center. I would have put it back down, except the flowers look like forget-me-nots, which are my all-time favorite flower. So I spent the $3 on it, as well as $3 on a smaller, more modern-style picture frame. My original goal was to put the flower and paper into the other frame and hang it up, but as soon as I arrived home, it became apparent that that wasn't going to happen. The brown paper on the back of the purple frame was ripped already, so when I finished ripping it off, I realized the picture frame was not only stapled shut, but nailed. Yeah, I guess I could have spent the extra 45 minutes digging out all the nails and staples, but I didn't. I'm lazy. I just hung it up the way it was. For two straight weeks, every single night, that picture frame would fall off the wall. It didn't matter how I hung it up. Stick on a hook, thumbtacks, actual hooks, even nails. It would be on my floor by the morning, occasionally waking me from my sleep when it fell. Some of the times when I woke up, I would hear rustling in the walls, like an animal was moving around in there. I would get up and put my ear to the wall, try to follow the sound so I could tell my dad where to look in the morning. My dad never found anything, but I was so sure something was moving in there, he called a professional pest guy. The pest guy didn't find any droppings or signs of life, but he agreed to leave a couple of traps in the attic. Before I explain this next part, let me lay out my room for you guys. It was a pretty big room, and considering I only had a twin bed pressed against the wall farthest from the door, despite me being 5'10", the room seemed even bigger. The window was directly over my bed, and I like to keep my blinds open because I like natural light and looking at the moon when I sleep. There's also a sister bathroom attached to another identical room on the same wall as the entrance. If you go deeper into the bathroom, where the toilet is, there's a door to the attic. There's a fair amount of space in there, but I only went in there when I had to because there were little tunnels and pockets of darkness that lead into the walls of the house. It creeped me out. That's where the pest guy set the traps, and yet, I would check them every morning and find nothing. It was even more frustrating when the noises started happening earlier in the day, or at twilight, increasing in frequency. And there was this horrible stench I can't explain that seemed to be coming from the walls now, too. And to be honest, about eleven days in, I adjusted and grew nose blind to it, and it only bothered me a little. I only remember how bad it was when someone else entered my room because they would recoil or comment on it, and they typically didn't stay for long. Around the two-week period mark, I realized I wasn't dealing with raccoons in my wall. I woken up to a knocking sound this time, like someone was banging on my door in the middle of the freaking night. I yelled out to, uh, just give me a second, and put on some pants, and the almost panicked sounding banging stopped. I opened my bedroom door to no one, and despite being a scaredy cat through and through, I was so sure it was someone in my family that I checked the whole house, turned on every light, and woke up my dad and sister who were apparently sleeping soundly to ask what was wrong. Then I double checked the locks and the doors, grabbed a knife, I was a scaredy cat okay, and went back to my room cautiously. Something about even stepping into that room made the hairs in the back of my neck stand triggered my fight or flight, so try as I did, I couldn't fall back asleep. I sat stock still listening for anything. I finally allowed myself to lay back and get comfortable. Not ten minutes later I heard it, a fainter knocking. It wasn't coming from my door though, no, it was coming from my walls. I didn't stay there long enough to investigate after that realization. No siree, I flew out of that room. I went and slept with my little sister in her room. She was freaked out already from me shaking her awake and didn't mind me sleeping in there anyway. The following day before school I had to go back in there to change. It smelled worse than I remembered, maybe because I hadn't slept there in a while and I just ignored the smell. I ignored the rustling. I spent about three minutes getting ready then booked it. By the time I get back from school I wasn't just scared, I was angry. If that was some kind of spirit, like I thought it might be, it had no business kicking around in my room like it thought it was the boss. It couldn't hurt me if I wasn't afraid. So I thought. So as soon as I got home, I went straight to my room. 
I cleaned up for a bit, I rehung my flower, and then I turned off the light and I sat on my bed, waiting. I waited until it started for about an hour until something made me sit up. I couldn't tell you exactly what. It's not like it got colder or even darker. It was only just reaching dusk and my window still illuminated my room completely, and I had fairy lights hanging over a desk in the corner. But it felt darker, if that makes sense. The air felt heavy. I sat up and strained my ears until I heard a faint knocking. First on one wall, then a second one closer to me, then one further away by my desk. So I did the most stereotypical thing you can do and was like, Hello? Nothing. Is anyone there? Nothing. Even the knocking stopped. And then I did something I regret a little, because it confirmed my theory that I wasn't an animal. I said, If someone's there, turn off my lights. I pointed to the fairy lights but didn't see anything happen at first. Then, just long enough to make me roll my eyes at myself, they turned off. I told the spirit to leave, that this was my room and they weren't welcome there. It actually made me feel better made the air lighter. I went downstairs and ate dinner. When I came back to go to bed, the picture frame was on the ground. This time, the fall had broken the glass and frame pretty bad. I cleaned up the glass, propped the thing by my wall and chilled in there until I didn't feel afraid anymore. Eventually, I went to bed. That night was the first and last time I had ever experienced sleep paralysis. I woke up in the dark, sleeping on my stomach. My face had an angle facing the bathroom door and my desk. I couldn't see the door to my room or the wall where I hung the picture. I wasn't panicked at first. I knew I couldn't move, but I was relieved I had escaped my dream, though I can't remember what it had been now. And then I realized I wasn't alone. I couldn't see anything, but I knew I wasn't. I could feel the presence, distinctly male presence, and I could feel the darkness in my room intensify. The shadows cast from the window move onto my wall as it or him approached me. I stared at the bathroom door, knowing if I could just move my fingers and my toes, could just jumpstart my limbs into action, I could get away. But I couldn't. The bed pressed in on both sides of my bed by my feet, like something had put their hands on either side of my feet. Then, bit by bit, I felt those invisible hands crawl further and further upward, could feel warm breath on my calves while I lay frozen in terror. I saw the bed move with my own eyes right by my tilted head. It compressed like someone was putting pressure on it, but there was nothing there. The warm breath expelled straight onto my neck. It touched my hip, its hand bigger than the span of my back, bigger than any hand I'd ever seen. It wasn't inappropriate I guess you could say but it was something pretty close to it it was possessive I couldn't see the thing but I could feel it I could feel its intent it didn't feel aggressive or violent but it felt malicious and most of all it felt smug I think if I had seen its face it would have been smiling and that scared me so much that finally I jerked away from its hold stumbled to the bathroom to the next bedroom literally unable to stop screaming until I was down the stairs. My dad and both my sisters rushed towards me, freaking out, and I immediately burst into tears. I told them what happened when I finally calmed down enough. My oldest sister was quick to say it was just a dream, a scientifically explainable occurrence, but my dad and my little sister were a little more willing to believe that it was something paranormal. We'd grown up hearing scary stories about my dad's haunted house, and we, to this day, are all believers. I threw away the picture a week later, a solid week of sleeping on the couch. I had thought long and hard about when it started, but it didn't take much deduction to conclude whatever spirit was haunting me was attached to that frame. As I threw it away, I noticed the entire inside of the frame was coated in this sticky, slimy red substance, and it smelled horrible, just like my room had. It was impossible to wash the stuff off, too. It took me a good 10 minutes and a lot of wasted water. Some other creepy stuff happened as well, even after I moved out, but it wasn't nearly that bad. 
And as much as I hate to be that person, as soon as I got interested in Quakerism and spirituality and I became more religious, all of those problems stopped entirely. What I do think is interesting is why I made this post in the first place. I moved out of my dad's house with a friend and hadn't moved back in at the start of COVID. About four months into it, I became more religious and it was like a weight was lifted off my chest. At the same time, three things happened that I think are worth noting, even though they didn't scare me. The last one I found out today. One, my dad and his employee turned my old bedroom into an office when I moved out. In the same week that I started feeling more like myself, Ben, the employee, came down the stairs looking extremely uncomfortable with a stack of papers in his hand. It was a stack of printed paper that had apparently come out of the printer. It was a slideshow my little sister had made for school back in ninth grade. It was printing out the pages in a loop, over and over again. Ben had turned off the printer multiple times, but it just kept turning back on and printing the same pages out. Apparently had been doing that all week, he said, and it was starting to scare him. But the funny thing is, that printer had been broken for almost a year. We could never get it to work or even turn on, and we even had another printer at that point. My dad just never got around to throwing it away. It was also late summer by that point, and my sister was just about to enter 10th grade. Two, not even five minutes after he said that, we hear a loud crash and two screams from upstairs. While my sister and her friend were in the bathroom, somehow her 50-pound giant mirror had crashed onto the floor and shattered into a million pieces. It had been leaning against the wall, and it would take a lot of strength to knock that thing over. It's not something that happens on accident. Both Ben and the friend left pretty quickly after that, freaked out, though Ben did a better job of concealing it. 3. My dad has had sleep paralysis too. Once, and only once, he just told me about it, and as he told me, I got this very unsettling feeling. It was within a two-week period of the mirror incident. So, what if I never really got rid of the spirit? What if it had followed me, lost its grip on me, and was looking for a new host? My sister is the most depressed she's ever been in her life, just like I had been when I moved out, and I felt like I was going crazy. It's a stretch, but... It's worth posting. If, if you read until the end, thank you. And please, let me know what you think. I was kind of an idiot as a kid. I did a lot of ridiculous stuff, but this encounter? Just let me tell you, I learned my lesson about breaking into places that really should be left alone. It was in the middle of the summer... Me and my friends sat on a wooden fence smoking cigarettes, thinking about what to do with ourselves. One of my friends suggested an abandoned hospital up the road from my house. We were unsure at first, as we'd heard a lot of stories from people who had previously went years ago before it was boarded up again. After much discussion, we went, and it was boarded up with wood nailed to the windows. The doors were sealed shut, so there was no way we could have gotten in that way. We were going to walk away and just go home, but luckily I remember I had something at home that I could get the boards off with. As we climbed through the window, we finally got in. It was like going through almost a time warp, I guess you could say. The place wasn't heavily damaged and the interior looked like it was from the 70s or 60s. There was still stale, bloody towels there too. It was very eerie. Anyways, we messed around and freaked each other out for a few hours until we had to go. Before we left, we messed around with the fire extinguisher that had been left there. While everyone was in the center of the hospital, I stepped out for a breather in the hallway with the window we entered through. I was at the bottom of the hallway and I saw a pale, slender figure in a blue hospital gown climb out of the window while looking at me. He looked tired and sick. I froze and screamed. We left as soon as it appeared. I didn't really know what to make of it, but I'll never forget how incredibly freaky it was. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Time.
If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in huge compilations and save big on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links down below. Thanks so much, friends. And I'll see you again soon.